Just last week, this 2022 Toyota Tundra was completely stock. I took it out on a couple of trips and it did surprisingly well, but it had a couple of drawbacks. It desperately needed tires. This thing came with what are basically street tires and it needed more ground clearance. I struggled a lot with breakover angles. So it was time to build it out and make some modifications in preparation for the trip that we're currently on. Unfortunately, I only had four days to get everything done that you see here. So it was a bit of a rush and I consider this to be kind of a mid build. There's definitely a lot of stuff left to do, but I'm gonna take you around, show you what we have done and I'll put links to everything that I've done and everything that I mentioned on here in the description. First stop was CBI Off-Road in Idaho Falls where the Prince Who Roof Rack is made. CBI has a huge facility where they design, cut and powder coat their racks before taking them down the road for packaging and shipping. If you recently bought a Prince Who Rack, you might see it here. I think the Prince Rack looks great. It's what I went with on my previous vehicle just because I love the slimline look of it, the way it fits against the roof line, and it doesn't add a lot of wind noise either. Unfortunately, this generation of Tundra doesn't come with any roof mounting points like it does on the 4Runner and on the Tacoma. So you do have to drill into this and you have to drill in in four places to mount this roof rack, but it does give it a good solid base. And this one, does not shift no matter how much you shake it and you put a ton of weight on top of it. On the sides, I've added the Summit handles from Prinsu, and this is the first time that I've had these handles, but I really like them. They give you a solid handhold so you can pull yourself up, lean back, or grab stuff off the roof when you're loading or unloading. Really, really helpful. I've got one on either side, and I think I'm probably gonna grab another pair uh, so I can put some at the front here for the front doors and move the ones I've got a little further back for the back doors. And I keep a lot of stuff in these cases. These are the rugged cases from Rome Adventure Company. They're the 83 liter ones. And I think they look great, but more importantly, they're completely dust proof and waterproof. And there's a ton of storage space inside. So in this one, I keep a lot of the loose things that would normally get lost inside my vehicle or in the bed. Uh, so I've got like both my camp chairs in here. I've got my light ranger in here. I should keep the stove in here as well to stop it. If I put it in the bed, it gets filthy. If I keep it in the cab, it rattles around. But when it's up here, I don't have to listen to it. And the other side, I've got all my recovery gear and I've got my heater. And I think it's important to have both those up there. The heat is great because when it's cold, like it was here last night, I just pop the case open and I can run the, uh, the tubes into the tent to heat. And then recovery equipment, what I learned from uh, with the Forerunner, is that you've got to have it easy to get to. You may be stuck on a, I don't know, a 45 degree slope. You don't want to open up the back and open some drawers. You don't want to go digging through the back seat. If you can just climb up on the roof, pop the case open and grab them, that's the best place for them. There is an optional lid organizer for these cases as well. Unfortunately, they are sold out, uh, but I really look forward to getting them because that's going to help with organizing the smaller things. Basically, when you pop the lid up, the lid organizer is sitting in the top of the lid and you can just unzip pouches and grab whatever you need. It's going to be useful for both of them, including the recovery equipment in there. Talking of recovery equipment, I've also got the Max Tracks up here. It's another thing that's got to be easy to get to. Uh, these ones, maybe in the middle is a little harder, but with the handles on the outside, you can climb up high and you can just basically pop them off. I've got them on the quick release pins from Max Tracks, and those are mounted to the Max Tracks mount from Prinsu. These are also lockable. You can put a little padlock through the pins here. This is the kind of thing that get stolen, uh, just an opportunist to come along and see them, just pop them off because they're kind of expensive. But by having them in the middle, they're kind of out of sight. And then the padlock is just another thing to put people off. In the future, I probably will move these. Um, I plan on putting them on a bed rack, but I'll talk about that later because um, I want to run some of Redox solar panels, some of the fixed panels, probably down the center of the roof here. And finally, on the front of the roof rack, I went with a cutout. We have a cutout for a 40 inch light bar on here. Everyone knows the most important part of an off-road rig is the light bar. So today I'm down at Heretic Studio in Salt Lake City, and we're gonna turn this 40 inch bar of aluminum into a light bar to go along the top of the roof rack there. The first step in making my light bar was to stick it in the Haas CNC mill. From there, any burrs are removed by hand and it's anodized a short drive across town. Heretic has their circuit boards manufactured in Taiwan and LEDs come from Cree in North Carolina. Everything is assembled in-house and they even let me have a go at putting together my light bar. I was extremely slow, so I let the experts take over again for the ceiling, lens install, and final test. 
The light bar up there from Heretic Studio is super bright, and I went with the combo beam pattern. That gives me floodlights on the outside and then spotlights in the center, and that's great for uh, basically lighting up the outside of the trails a little bit, but focusing most of the light in the center of the trail where it is most important. Right now, the way I have it angled, it just barely touches the end of the hood, and it certainly doesn't give you any glare but I may angle it a little bit further out still because the spotlight's kind of about two car lengths ahead of me. That's good for about 20 to 30 miles an hour, but if you wanna go a little bit faster, you want that spotlight a little bit further away. And I have other lights that help me with the close-up stuff, and they're down here in the front of the grill. And here we've added replacement amber fog lights from Heretic and then a 20-inch amber bar in the middle from Heretic. And they put a ton of effort into designing these. They actually took the entire grill off, scanned it, and have designed brackets that only work with their lights for the fog lights and for the 20 inch in the middle. The fog lights, they basically look like factory fog lights still. They fit so close, so tight, and they work so well. And then the center 20 inch bar is just hidden away perfectly. Having the true amber lights down low is great as well because true amber has a longer wavelength than white or yellow light. And the longer wavelength means that it doesn't get refracted by particles in the air as much. So it's great for dusty conditions. It's also really good for snow. Uh, if you have a bright white light, it tends to reflect back a lot on the snow where the amber doesn't reflect as harshly. Ideally, what you have is a white light bar up high and then amber lights down low. And if you end up going with these, I actually do recommend getting both the fog lights and the center 20 inch, because they work really well with their beam pattern. The fog lights are angled slightly out just because of the way Toyota designed it. So it gives you a nice spread just out to the sides. And then the 20 inch in the middle basically lights up right down the middle of the trail. It's also just easier to install both sets together. To install the 20 inch, you do have to take the entire grill off and basically mount it to the bumper underneath where the fog lights, you can pop off this trim on the front, but it's easier to pop this trim off when the whole grill is off. To control the lights, I'm using Redox Red Vision System. It's basically a power distribution system that's currently sitting in the back under the back seat. Not quite ready to show you that, partially because I'm not finished with it and partially because it's underneath everything. So I don't wanna dig all of that out. But that can be controlled from either this screen that's sitting up front or from the phone app. If I'm controlling it from the screen, all I need to do is just push the soft keys. Uh, so I've just turned on the 20 inch amber light bar I turn it off, I can turn on the 40 inch light bar across the top. So it's all super easy to control from the driver's seat using this. Uh, this is mounted using a RAM mount at the back and then a mount that is specifically designed for the red vision screen that comes from trail racks. And that's all bolted into the panel here at the back. Anytime I cut holes in the vehicle or drill into the vehicle. I try and do it to something that's easily replaced. And this is one of those things. It's just a single panel back there. So if I ever decide I want to sell the vehicle or change this system up, I could probably buy another one of those panels for around $20, $30. Uh, and all I need to do is pop off some trim and I can pull that out and replace it. Power for the whole system comes from an enormous 200 amp hour lithium iron phosphate battery from LionCore. That thing has power for days. If I'm just running the fridge, it could easily in hot weather run it for a week or more. Uh, and actually recently left this with CBI and Heretic Studio so they could do the fitting for the roof rack and for the light bars. And I was thinking, I left it with them for four weeks and I thought when I, come, when I came back that everything would be dead. But this battery still had about 40% remaining. It was running the fridge that whole time. Obviously, it's cold weather. Uh, in warmer weather, it's not going to last as long, but I still imagine I could easily get a week out of it running the fridge. And I do think that by adding one of the solar panels from Red Arc, I can extend that. It may even run the fridge indefinitely. Unfortunately, I do also run other things off this system, so it's not just the fridge drawing power. Uh, like I said, I've got that, the heated blankets. Uh, right now, it's charging a Jackery, a laptop, uh, and we're down at 69%, 13 hours remaining with it pulling 10 to 11 amps charging those two things. And they also run the lights uh, around the vehicle. So when I turn those on, it obviously pulls a lot more power and it drops down to eight hours of running the 20 inch light bar at the front. I've never actually run the battery all the way down though. And that's because 
first of all, you don't run your light bar for eight or nine hours. It's usually just an hour or two at a time. And it's because this whole system is charging while the vehicle's running. Uh, it's charging using Redox Manager 30, which gives me 30 amps of power in from the vehicle's alternator while the vehicle's running. And then I can also use that if I have to with solar, like I mentioned already, uh, or if I'm sitting at home well, this is sitting in a shop for extended periods of time, I could plug it in to 120 volt main, main power or shore power. If you do end up doing a dual battery setup in your Toyota Tundra, just make sure that you get a charging system that supports a smart alternator because this new Tundra has a smart alternator. That basically means that when the system detects that the starter battery is fully charged, the alternator shuts off and with uh, maybe a cheaper charging setup, it would no longer charge your second battery. Uh, with this one, you run a wire, it senses when the engine's running, and it will just continue to charge that second battery when the engine's running, and it'll force the smart alternator to be on all the time, or on whenever it's needed to be on. For the bed, it was back to CBI, who had just released their Overland crossbars. Installation of the bars is really simple. You slide the mounting plate in the tracks along the bedside, and bolt the vertical supports in. We chose to mount the rooftop tent from iCamper backwards on the bars so it sat flush with the roof line at the front. After lining everything up, the tent still overhung the back of the truck by about a foot. In the back is one of the things I'm not quite happy with yet, it still needs a little more work. It's basically the down to the combination of the bed and tent setup that I've got here. I've got the longer tent, I've got the SkyCamp 2.0, and I've got the short bed, five and a half foot bed. And it, to me, I think it looks a little bit goofy. Uh, the combination would work better if I had either the long bed with the long tent or the short bed with the short tent. Uh, there is a solution to that though, uh, and it's down to CBI. Uh, so basically this is kind of temporary. They were kind enough to let me borrow their bed bars here to mount this tent while they work on their full height bed rack. So once their bed rack's done, I'll be replacing these and I'll have the full height system that comes up to basically the height of the back of the cab or the height of the roof rack at the back of the cab. And that means that this tent can shift forward. It'll no longer hang off the back and everything on the roof rack will shift forward as well. And it'll basically be a perfect fit. And I'll be a lot happier because it'll look better. That'll also give me the storage space that they have on the back of their bed rack. Uh, so I'll be able to move the traction boards down here and that'll free up the room for the solar panels up there. Underneath the crossbars, I also have a slightly modified tonneau cover. This is one of the soft roll-up ones, and all I had to do to modify it to make it fit inside the crossbars was remove a tiny piece of rubber trim from the end up here, and a tiny piece of rubber trim from the end up this end. And it now fits underneath, and I can roll it up uh, or unroll it as necessary. It is a little bit difficult fitting it here. Uh, you just have to kind of weave it around those bars as you're unrolling it. Uh, and actually, most of the time, I leave it rolled up like this because it tends to trap the dust in the bed. There's lots of holes in here. There's gaps down the side. There's gaps at either end. And that was even before I put these crossbars on. It collected the dust inside. So when I'm on the trails, it stays like that. The dust just blows right back out again. Basically, the only times that I unroll it to cover the bed is either when it's raining or snowing uh, or if I'm doing long distances on the highway or if this is going to be parked somewhere where I don't want people just kind of looking in and seeing what's in the bed. So inside the bed is fairly full. It definitely needs a lot better organization. So one of the things I'm considering adding is a draw system either from SHW Off-Road or from Decked. I'll probably go with the SHW Off-Road one just because it's gonna be a, a lot more custom fitted uh, and have a lot less wasted space. In the meantime, I picked up some of these totes from Home Depot and actually really like these things. I just picked them up to be a temporary thing, but I'll probably end up keeping them and using them on top of the draw system uh, because they are completely sealed. They've got a clear plastic lid on top so I can see what's inside. And when you open them up, you can take the whole top off or if you just undo the two sides, they kind of hinge using these two handles on the other side. I also have the Iceco fridge. This is their 75 quart uh, pro range fridge. Another thing that I really, really like, and it works really well with the whole bed set up here. Right now it's a little bit difficult because you have to pull it out, um, but you can get into it from either side. So when it's out here sitting on the end, in fact, I'll just pull it out now. So I can show, uh, 
you can either open it up from this side or you can open it up from the other side or if it's sitting underneath a tonneau cover or a tent, something like that, and you're just loading and unloading stuff, you can open it from both sides. And it just makes finding stuff inside there a whole lot easier. Behind that, I also have a bunch of water. So I've got drinking water on this side. I've got a couple of one gallon things, a six gallon can of it. Uh, this side I've got shower water. And then behind that, just a few other random things. Got like a compressor, a Julka shower, the Julka shower tent, which is fantastic. I still need to do a video on that. Uh, and then right at the back, I've got the propane, 20 pound propane tank for the, uh, the heater. I'm gonna have a full video of this tent coming out soon. So I'm gonna go over uh, some of just the highlights, some of my favorite things about it. Uh, but basically, I've switched. I used to have the Tough Stuff Alpha, and after having some UV issues with the shell, basically it was breaking down in the sunlight, uh, I figured it's time for a change, and this came highly recommended. I had several people telling me iCamper is the way to go, so here it is. I've switched to this, and I can already see there is a big difference in quality. Um, two of the main things I've noticed are, well, the shell, first of all, much, much thicker, um, hopefully a lot more durable, hopefully stands up to the UV. Um, I've heard from people, including a couple of Patreon supporters, that they've had theirs for a couple of years and have had no change to the quality of the shell. So that's a good sign. And then the second thing is just the, the, the quality of the canvas the tent material up here. Uh, it's very, very thick. It reminds me of those old fashioned canvas tents, just with the thickness of it. And I really, really like that because it cuts out the sunlight. I've been sleeping in quite late over the last few days because when the sun rises, I don't really notice it. So that's a big improvement there. Because I have absolutely zero patience, I went with the SkyCamp 2.0. If I had waited like another month or two, I could have gone with the SkyCamp 3.0, which is their new and improved one. They they took a lot of their feedback and made a lot of changes. And one of the changes they made fixes one of the things that I like least about this, and that's that I cannot store a lot of bedding in there. In fact, I can barely store anything at all. Uh, with the SkyCamp 3.0, they made it slightly taller uh, and changed the mattresses apparently so that you can fit more bedding in here. Right now, the only thing I can leave in there are my pillows. I may end up switching out the mattresses for inflatable ones uh, so that I can fold them flat or deflate them flat and leave more bedding up there. So the only other upgrades to talk about now are the wheels and suspension. For the suspension, we traveled down to Westcott Designs in Phoenix. They have a huge facility where they produce lifts, rock sliders, roof racks, and hitch mount tire racks. The first thing I noticed when I walked in is what they're watching on TV. They also do installs, so they got my Tundra up on a lift and started installing their preload collar lift. This kit doesn't break the bank, but it also works a lot better than a cheap spacer lift. Uh, we got a lot of guys asking and saying, ah, oh, or we see it online, they say, oh, it's a spacer lift and it's a preload collar and they're all in the same thing. And really they're not the same thing. They're really not the same thing by any means. The only thing that they do that they are the same is they create lift in the vehicle. They both add lift to the truck. But the difference is a spacer lift bolts to the top of the strut here on the top, pushes the strut assembly down. So now you have limited your upward travel. So as this compresses itself, it no longer bottoms out on the bump stop on the bottom. It bottoms out uh, internally in the shock, which it's not designed to do. And what happens is I call this the fuse right here. When it bottoms out so many times internally because it can't take the weight of the vehicle it actually causes them to crack here or snap off of there so people say ah oh, you know how is yours different i said it's a preload collar and the way it works is just like this this is a perfect example this is a fox 2.0 coilover the threaded body is on the bottom side of this so as i turn this dial and and create compression or uh preload on the spring here what it does is it creates lift the opposite direction. So basically our collar replaces the lower collar down here and goes in down here. And this is the preload. We do not make it adjustable because we set the ride quality on this. Uh, on top of setting the ride quality, we set the height and everything to go with it. It is, it's not just add preload to it and get the ride just like this. If I put too much preload in this, then it makes the ride harsh. If I don't put enough lift in it, then I, or, or enough dial in it, then I'm not gonna get enough lift on this truck. So basically if I do this and I set this at the right ride height, 
I can get the ride quality and I can get the lift out of the truck at the same time. So we did this, we've set the ride height on this. It's all set, you, you do an alignment on it. You can use the factory upper control arms on this truck. And when the kit's installed, it looks factory. Um, if anything, it's heavier duty than the factory stuff that we took out of this truck. And it does use the factory bump stop just like it was designed. So the same downward travel and upward travel and no travel is lost and the shock is not taking the hit when this thing compresses itself all the way. The final steps were to get the 37 inch tires mounted to the wheels, pin the fender liners to make room for them and trim a small piece of the air dam to prevent rubbing. We lowered it off the lift, then since I'm the first person to put 37s on for off-road use, we tested the rub under articulation. It'd be fine for on-road driving, but this is as far as we could flex before rubbing. Unfortunately, 37s just weren't meant to be. I don't think it's the right choice for what I'm doing, at least not yet. You'd have to put a whole lot more work into it, switch out a lot of the suspension components to make it work for serious off-road driving. So for now, I've gone to 35s and I think I made the right choice. Even with 35s, I have managed to rub a couple of times on the front end, not under normal driving, not even under full articulation on an obstacle, but just going over big bumps like the whoops and the sand dunes I hit those a little bit too fast. I managed to bottom this out and uh, rub when I landed off those. And I went with these, which are the Toyo Open Country AT3s. I chose these ones because it was either this or the BF Goodrich KO2, and I've already had KO2s, and I wanted to try something new. So I'll test these out, see how they wear, see how they do. I've heard they balance a lot better than the KO2s, so I'm looking forward to that. And they're mounted to these wheels, which are the Method 705s. These are 18 inch wheels, nine inches wide, and I've got a positive 18 offset, which I think gives it a really good stance. It sticks out just a little bit, but not too much. And these are the bead grip wheels. That means that it has little grooves where the bead sits as well as an oversized safety hump, and basically holds the bead a lot better than a standard tire. That means you can generally go to lower tire pressures than you could with a normal tire. There's still not bead lock, which means you can technically lose the bead still, but it's just a lot less likely with the bead grip. If this is something you want to get for your Tundra or for any vehicle, uh, I've actually partnered with Method to get you guys a discount. You can go to methodracewheels.com forward slash Revere Overland or just click the link in the description. You can get 20% off any Method race wheels, which is just a crazy good deal. So what about the lift? Well, I'll start off with saying it's it's obviously better than your traditional spacer lift, something from rough country. This is going to far outlast it. It's going to put a lot less strain on the suspension system. And if you want something that's for looks, for street driving, for light off-roading, this is perfect. However, if you do long overland trips, if you're doing a lot of serious off-roading, I actually don't think Westcott Design's lift is the best option for you. And there are a couple of reasons for that. One of them is that it reuses Toyota's own suspension components and they just aren't really good enough for off-road. And that's another thing that I'm disappointed with from Toyota and with the TRD off-road package. You would think that their suspension would have better uh, articulation, better travel, and it really doesn't. The back travel in this is terrible. And that's not West Coast Design's fault, that's Toyota's fault. The second reason is that when you add that preload collar to the front suspension, you are compressing that spring and it just gives you a harsher ride. It's okay on pavement, it's okay on light off-road, gravel roads, that kind of thing. But when you're doing rocky roads, if you're doing washboard roads, the harsher ride is just, it gets old very, very quickly. When something comes out that's more tuned for off-road driving that does offer more articulation in the front and the rear, I probably will switch to that. I don't regret getting the Westcott Designs lift because it allows me to do what I'm doing here. A lot of the trails we've done over the past few days, I could not have done with the stock suspension set up in the Tundra without the lift, without these tires. So it was a good purchase. And it's also something I'll probably end up keeping in the future because when you get a really high-end suspension system that is tuned for off-roading is usually something that has to be rebuilt. And if I keep this, I can switch in the Westcott stuff while I send off my other stuff to be rebuilt. I'm sure a bunch of you are wondering that now that I've added all these mods, how has the performance changed, especially with the lift and the wheels, the tires that I've added. And in terms of acceleration, I haven't noticed much. This thing has a ton of power. If you put your foot down, it goes. In terms of fuel economy, I have noticed a difference. So with this thing completely stock, 
on the trail, I was getting around 12 miles per gallon. City driving, you're looking around 17, 18. And then on the highway, at best, you're looking around 22, 23 miles per gallon. That's all kind of shifted around. Off-road and on the trails, I'm still getting about the same. 12 is my low end, so it's still between like 12 and 15 miles per gallon, depending on the type of trail that I'm on. You know, if I'm in four low, it's obviously gonna be lower. If I'm on just a gravel road, it's gonna be a little bit higher. City driving, still about the same, but it's once you go over about 55 to 60 miles an hour that you really start to notice the difference. I took a recent trip, we drove for about an hour, an hour and a half at about 55 to 60 miles an hour, and I was getting about 20 miles per gallon. But when I got up onto the interstate, that dropped dramatically. I went down to about 14 to 15 miles per gallon at 75 miles an hour. Some of the loss of fuel economy is definitely due to the stuff that I've got up on the roof. Uh, before I added the lift, I did notice I dropped a couple of miles per gallon with those up there. But a lot of it is going to be down to this, the oversized tires. There are a few more mods that I need to mention. One of them is the WeBoost here. And again, this is another one of those things that's not quite finished. As with all of the wiring in the truck, I need to run that wire somewhere else permanently. Uh, but this adds or boosts the signal, uh, cell phone signal, and it really does work. Well worth getting if you're working on the road. Uh, you know, we can set up somewhere like here. With it off, we have absolutely no service. With it on, we're just getting text messages. In other places you go, you might have a little bit of service. You flip this on, suddenly it's usable. You can actually use data. You can make FaceTime calls. It's actually really worth having. Around the other side, let's go around the front. On the front here, I have paint matched the grill. This used to be chrome, and it was one of the things I hated most about the truck. Took this off, had both paint matched to the color of the truck. In the pictures, it does look a little bit different, and it may come across on camera, because I've got paint protection film on here, and then nothing on here. But I think that's a massive improvement, and I don't know why Toyota made this whole thing chrome in the first place. The only other thing worth mentioning are the seat jackers. If you come around here, you might be able to see. I'll back up so Andreas, my cameraman, can see. Down here are seat jackers. These are like their temporary ones. They were just testing them out on my truck. Uh, what it does is it lifts the front end of the seat up, but then I can use that button to lift the back of the seat up, and it basically raises the whole seating position, which means on the trail, you can see out the front really nicely uh, and actually makes it a lot more comfortable. Andreas really likes the driver's seat on this compared to the passenger seat, just because you get that high up truck driving position. Like I said earlier, I consider this to be mid-build. There's a lot of stuff I need to do still. Even with what I've got, those wires, they need to be rerun. We need to run them permanently. Getting a winch at some point and a winch bumper so I can recover myself if necessary. Desperately need rock sliders, armor underneath. You know, there's lots left to do, but that's all gonna be for a later video. I'm also gonna have some dedicated videos to some of the other modifications on here, like the tent. When I do the bumper installs, I'll probably video that too. And trip videos to places like this beautiful location. So make sure you subscribe to the channel so you can see that. If you click that little bell that's somewhere on the screen around me, then you'll get notifications too. Thanks for watching.